So who, I guess let's just you can raise your hands. Is that how that works in the participant thing? Actually, I didn't see that. Is that the thing in Zoom where you can like raise your hand? Yeah. If you open the participants thing. Ah, participants thing. Okay. Cool. Uh, like, put a thumbs up in the uh, participants channel if you are using serverless currently. Awesome. How come I don't see the raise hand thing? Am I like missing a button? Uh, I see it right oh, beside the yes, no, like not inside the three dots thing. No, because I just have yes, no, go slower, go faster. Oh. You're the host, so you're not going to have the raise your hand because raise your hand is going to get the attention of the host. We can't call on you. Uh, I'm not sure raise your hand works when we're allowed to speak. Yeah, well, I, thumbs up seems to work. Actually, I saw people raising their hands, and then they changed into thumbs up. Huh. All right, so we got a few, like probably what, a third of the audience is uh, doing some kind of serverless right now. Is, is, are most of these folks, are you all doing serverless on AWS? And is it Lambda? Are you doing other serverless things? Um, I am doing a lot of Fargate on AWS. Yeah. So there's been a big debate at our company, mostly between Caleb and I, on whether that's truly serverless or not. I say it is. Caleb's like, uh, I don't know. So like what happened was one time Calvin said <laughs> serverless, and I was like, do you mean like the narrow scope, like Lambda only, or do you mean the broad based, like all the things? And Calvin's like, all the things. And then he always bring, I wish you would stop bringing it up because I, okay, I, I don't have a disagreement. I just needed to know what you meant. Okay, I will forever never bring that up again. Perfect. We, we are in agreement then on serverless. <laughs> so yes, Fargate counts in all of our books as serverless. Hey, Adam, I have a question for you on that. Are you running uh, like, long-lived services on Fargate, or are you using it more of like task management, like spinning off uh, like cron tasks or combo of both? Or? Um, for the most part, it is long running. Uh, we migrated from EC2 into all Fargate, and we'll also use scheduled tasks. Um, so it's nice because everything is done the same way now. And you're using ECS or EKS? ECS, no Kubernetes. Yeah, same here. We've uh, skipped the Kubernetes train for the moment and just gone with Terraform and Fargate. Yeah, I'm conflicted. We're going through the same conversation right now and trying to decide anything that gets me off of my EC2s will make me happy. Yeah. Exactly. Was, with that, though, I mean, obviously, there's people who are doing like active development or releasing often. So it means you're building new containers with like most recent images, what do people do when you've got a site that doesn't receive maybe updates, but maybe a couple times a year, like old, you know, maybe service account type things that may be running on old versions of images that could have vulnerabilities? Do folks have like CI jobs that are just maybe periodically putting up new versions of those things? Because that's my worry is that a, a Docker container could still bit rot just as bad as a an EC2 instance if you don't pay attention to it, right? No, it shouldn't. And I want to take a quick diversion back to flavors of UCS. Um, so one of the things that we learned in a project just recently is that with, East, with traditional, like roll your own ECS, you can totally control the instance types that you get to run. Whereas with Fargate, you don't get as much control. And we found some, um, what I believe would be performance problems related to that. That's something to bear in mind is that you kind of you get less choices of, of instance flavor under the ECS. Yeah. Well, so. I was speaking more to the like the security surface of the software in the container itself. Right. Like if you, well, if you you can go ahead. If if you're running, you know, some some service that has a a, a library that's got a, a security issue associated to it unless you've got some kind of automated job that's periodically pulling a new image and build it, rebuilding your software on top of that new image, you're still in the same boat as if you just had EC2 and neglected that as well. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so you don't have bit rot per se because the image that you create is 100% immutable, right? Like 
you blow it away and it comes back with the same image. Uh, right. Over over. Yeah, if you want to take care of that with regular builds and pass that through something like Viracode or, um, what's the name of the service I forget. Uh, Another service that I, yeah, completely gone. But there, there are static, there are code analysis tools out there that will basically say, hey, we've identified these vulnerabilities and, and you should address those on a, on a regular basis. But yeah, security at the risk is a thing. So are folks doing something to mitigate that? I mean, do you have just CI jobs on a pipeline someplace? To yeah, in the other service, I was thinking of a sonar cube. Sorry, um, but yeah, so you would, you know, um, at least once every one, you know, once in every one, once in a while, you would either choose a tag to build from. So let's say you're like using Alpine, right? Um, update your Alpine tag, and you would build a new container, and then you would run it through your your sonar cube. If it finds any vulnerabilities, then you would you would address those that way. Mm -hmm. Keep running it until you're ready to deploy, and then it would update basically the 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 task definition in ECS. Right. Is anyone in the room using EKS? You know, Michael, you said you guys are contemplating it. Yes. We, we use it for a couple uh, non-core services today, but that's kind of where we got to is evaluating whether or not we wanted to dive deeper into that or lean a little bit more into the uh, ECS side of things. Yeah, so we're using EKS right now. Um, it's the greatest version because I just I just spun this up. Of course, it's probably no longer latest and greatest anymore. But one of the nice things about EKS is that there's and I haven't played around with it yet, but there's support for external secrets. So those would be secrets tied into uh, uh, I believe AWS SSM parameter store, or at least the secrets manager part of that. <clears throat> That's what we're using the the primary store for secrets with just Fargate currently. Um, yeah. I have a question about that, how you're yeah. managing secrets per app. I have, we've been talking about several approaches and haven't decided on one yet. And Caleb, how do we have ours set up right now for each environment? There's a separate like store. I don't, I'm not as familiar with the parameter store stuff as maybe Caleb is. Mm -hmm. um, so I wasn't really paying attention. Um, but, but I heard you say Bramble store and what are we doing? Um, yes. so, so I can tell you that, um, we're just using the, the, like the default, like, like namespace capability inside the parameter store to put in, um, like there's each environment has like a root level, like folder. And then we put all the stuff like, um, under there, depending on what it is, what it belongs to. Cool. That's, yeah, that's exactly what we've been thinking about, um, because right now we only have a few, like a handful of services. So we're not using namespaces. So we just sort of like, okay, there's secrets that every app needs and that's where we're gonna keep them in the parameter store. But we thought it would be nice to use the namespaces. And so each app just gets its own version of all the secrets. And on when it boots up, it can just pull them down from the API mm -hmm. rather than being injected through the task definition. Mm -hmm. So we, we just haven't been able to decide what approach to take, but that seems like a nice way to do it by just giving each app its own namespace. Yeah, it's, it's convenient in that way um, because you can then also control access to those with IAM policy to like match. That's another thing that Greg and I were talking about when we first got on was like using IAM policy is nice instead of AWS for access to S3 buckets or just any kind of resource giving roles. So that limits using secrets or at least eliminate some of them. Was anyone using Vault for secret storage? Not at the moment, but I have. Did I you like it? I the intelligence <laughs> about it at all. I think okay. <laughs> there's, a, I just pointed out an article a couple of weeks ago about how they have, uh, I think there's a vault secrets injector. And I almost always talk about Kubernetes because it seems like everything I've worked on has been Kubernetes. But yeah, so there's a vault secret injector that will um, 
that automates a lot of like the really complicated portions of getting like secrets out of vault using tokens. And so it will, it will inject those into your pod, which is nice. Is that different than the like app roll stuff? It is uh, very closely related to it. It may be like app rolls made less clunky, I think. Mm. So yeah, we, we set up app rolls and I'm, I'm not sure that we did it right. Um, but we did have a rotating key and then we had to go through and update that key every once in a while. And, you know, so when we, we didn't use it in Kubernetes itself. Uh, that just ended up being like the standard Kubernetes secrets, which aren't secret at all. Um, <laughs> but then, uh, you know, the values that were populated into those secrets through Helm charts were, were pulled out of vault. Um, so we also use Camus instead of vault. We eventually transitioned from, from, from vault into Camus. And then since I moved on from that project, I think they actually went back to Vault. Um, yeah, so I guess one question. Uh, in terms of just storing secrets, uh, how do you guys decide on where to use secrets manager or parameter store, I guess? So what are the use cases for each one of them that you have if you come like, across? If, if you like spending a lot of money, you can use secrets manager. And if you don't like spending a lot of money, you can use parameter store. <laughs> I don't know. Is there a difference? Yeah. So secrets manager will provide you with secret rollover. So if you wanted to automatically roll and change mm. those secrets for you, then that's kind of nice. Uh, also, if you're using like serverless, Aurora, things like that, then it helps you like log into the database from the console. But I mean, I'm, I think SSM param store is just better if you don't need that secret rollover. Yeah, it seemed like the secrets managers integration with RDS was the most compelling thing when we looked at it and we still decided um, to punt on it and just stick to parameter store since that was just easier to go to and it was just more obvious like, okay, yeah, we should start using this. But the RDS integration with secrets manager seemed like it was going to be worth it in the long run once we, <laughs> once we get back around to it. I think it also kind of depends on what kind of information you're storing, right? Like you can use param store for things that aren't secrets as well. So if you need something to, to grab, you know, um, an ARN or, you know, whatever it is, some sort of ID that isn't secret, then you can use param store. They don't have to be secure strings either. So. Yeah, I definitely wish for lambdas, it was easier to use the parameter store to grab values and you kind of don't have much choice um, in your app. It looks like, like you're basically just going to have to grab, like use the okay. SDK in your app to pull stuff down if you don't want to just like throw uh, into the environment variables. Which, yeah, not so secret secrets. Yeah, if it's... <laughs> If it's not secret, then I just throw it into the environment variables. The CDK makes that pretty easy to query them and push them in. But if it's secret, yeah, I kind of usually just do this boilerplate configure function and then I'll just store them as global variables. And if they're undefined, then I pull them from store. It's and annoying. You but <clears throat> and you only do that at like service start, basically. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it sucks for the cold starts, but there, you got to do something. So, I don't know. I guess with EFS now, you could use EFS and put them on there, but that seems sketchy. So I don't advise that. <laughs> seems sketchy on multiple levels. You have to, you need to be using EFS. I don't know. It's Although, adding EFSs to everything, and it's making my serverless architecture feel more and more like I have a server when I start throwing all these other things back into play. It's kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely feels more natural to use like the S3 and you know, some RDS for all the storage of things.
what framework do you use for developing Lambda? I haven't done much Lambda in the last year or so. And I, I um, wouldn't really use, uh, we weren't using a framework at that point. Is anybody using other frameworks for Lambda? We love using Go. Yeah. Does anyone use SAM? I mean, that's what AWS recommend. I've used SAM in the past, but I'm pretty much all in on the CDK at this point. And yeah, it makes good things. Yeah, it makes using TypeScript super easy too. So mm -hmm. it'll um, bundle everything for you for the most. I mean, there's some weird issues that I've run into, but yeah, I, I mean, SAM is nice for the for a lot of reasons, and they have like those built-in like kind of template things, but the CDK just seems a lot more manageable long-term, in my opinion. And does yeah. it allow test as well? I mean, like with Sam, with Docker? So you have to, if you want to run it locally, you still have to use Sam, but there are a couple of ways out there where you can, you basically, synthesize your CDK templates and then you invoke it with Sam local invoke. I haven't, I haven't done it in a while, uh, but yeah, you, you kind of just have to output that template and then run it that way. And does anyone use layers or no? Yeah, that got introduced after I kind of stopped doing some Lambda stuff. I've found that it, it's nice if you have some business logic that you have to spread across, or if you have to put in NumPy or, you know, some of these big packages, but it kind of introduces this headache that if it's just small amounts of boiler, boilerplate code, I found it easier to just write templates and then use Yo or, you know, whatever template generator or something you want to use. XND end up kind of back in the same dependency mess if you're just trying to manage like what layers you need. Yeah, and then you have to manage the versions and stuff. It yeah. kind of comes down to, you know, what even what you mentioned earlier with that kind of rot of your images, so your containers. Yeah, and if folks upgraded from using the API gateway to using the new HTTP gateway, yeah, <laughs> I've, not, I've not tried it yet. It was awkward at first, but it made a few things kind of easier. So I've, I've only used it once, but <laughs> once, I, once I switched over, it was, it was pretty nice, so. Yeah. Is it just basically like their REST API gateway, but like the light version? Uh, we're gonna try to use that to tweak some of our rate limiting stuff this week. One of those uh, API gateways, and I haven't looked into their HTTP one versus like the REST one that much. I would say that they're very, very similar. Um, I mean, you can proxy everything to a Lambda. You can have a fallback and all these different things, you know, or you can uh, set it up like you would the, the regular rests. And then you, you know, maybe you want to just use it as a proxy to some other HTTP site and, you know, kind of some of those connectors. So that's nice. It's, but yeah, it's, it's very similar to just using the V the V1, but a few nicer features, so. And cookies just work automatically, by the way. So that was, that's the reason I used it was the cookie just worked. Yeah. Anyone else doing active Lambda development right now? It's interesting. It's like everyone's kind of upgraded into Fargate or some other quick run a task type thing. Like for scheduled tasks, are most people just using Fargate then? Because you get to basically run a container? That's what we're doing for things yeah. that we need. We like it. Um, we still use, we have a couple Lambda services that are nice, like for um, handling file uploads. Um, we just can get a pre signed S3 URL. And then Lambda can listen on that. And it was a lot easier going that route than um, using another Fargate service, but no reason why we couldn't 
is just a good excuse to take advantage of Lambda, I think. <laughs> um, hasn't caused us any problems. So yeah, I like, I like the Fargate platform. Yeah. For Fargate. the Lambda with the S3 stuff, have you run into the problem of the notifications not being guaranteed? Like that a new file was created that you'd have to go through and periodically look for things that got unprocessed, that were unprocessed? Um, that does show up sometimes. Um, I something. guess I can't comment too much about like how um, how often or what the yeah. impact has been, but yeah, we have noticed something like that occasionally. But that so that it's now at least once. I think that was like in the last year they changed that. I could be wrong. Yeah. What does the cold start time look like for um, for Fargate on ECS? Like seconds, like milliseconds, like what do you? Because I know, I mean, Lambda is pretty good. Their cold start normally isn't too much, but obviously, the more you add into some of your applications, you're going to start seeing longer and longer setup times. Um, I don't know really what like the boot looks like. And we were actually deploying Docker images into EC2 before we moved over to Fargate. So I can't imagine it was in, like we had much uh, difference there. And now we don't have to manage the server. Um, and that's, that's like, the win right there. <laughs> so the idea was we're going to trade off like uh, buying like the pre-alloc, like knowing what our load was going to be ahead of time versus um, just having more flexibility with using the compute we're actually using. So, um, so far it seemed to be about the right trade-off to make. Like we're not really spending much differently. So it's just worth it. It was a win-win in that, in that sense. But yeah, it's just a service that starts up and doesn't die until we deploy something new and then it rolls over. So um, very easy since we were already building the images for Docker anyway. And why is it better to run, for example, Python program on Fargate versus Lambda? Hmm. I mean, on Lambda, I need, and I create it immediately. I don't need to install anything, just using SAM, small program, push, deploy, and it's done. And what is advantage on Fargate? Timeouts is a big one. If you have any fear at all that you're going to time out after, you know, whatever the configurable number of seconds is for a Lambda to run. That's a huge one. Yeah, I would say it, it depends like mostly on like, what is the application doing, right? If it's like opening a listener and you're expecting like clients to hit it, um, <clears throat> then, and, and it, it's like a Django app or something, right? You wouldn't shove that into a Lambda. Uh, but you can absolutely you, run a Django. You could. <laughs> you can. It mean, depends on whether you like yeah, to program through API gateway or not, right? Yeah. Like, I meant to say you curious. didn't. I don't, I don't think. Oh, I mean, yeah. I, I have seen some presentations on API gateway, and I just think, like, you're taking all your code and you're moving it into this service that you configure to do things based on, like, what HTTP verb came in and, you know, whether it's a. Uh, yeah. Um, another good advantage, I think, to Fargate, even if you're just running like a one-off task, is that your development and your deployment experience is going to be the same. Where yeah. Lambda, you kind of have to fake what production looks like. But if you're building a Docker image uh, to run on Fargate, that's the same thing you can use for debugging the development. So even for something like a task, if it doesn't yeah. have to like, be on a like webhook sort of thing, Fargate could still make sense. Yeah, that, that's my dream is to get the developer experience that they, they don't recognize as a difference between like what I'm doing here and when it gets deployed because it's all containers. So we, I've been kind of preaching using Compose for bringing down like Redis and the database and you know, Mailhog and any all the other services you would be using inside of AWS, you know, have a local version of them running in some image that's you know, two lines in a Compose file and you've got a Redis server like ready to go for your app. I'll, I'll say it's, it's been a bit rocky though. Um, the Mac experience is kind of terrible for Docker, unfortunately. 
You think so? When, I, I like it. I've uh, never had But okay, so this is, you may like it, but you may also have Stockholm Syndrome and don't know it. Uh, <laughs> because, because you're running a VM to then run all your stuff. And so I, I've, for the last two years now, been on a Linux desktop as my main machine. And it's wonderful. Like it is so smooth. It is, there's zero problems. It's super fast because it's Docker in that case is just running processes on my machine like they would anyway. No, that's true. That's definitely, that's, that's, <laughs> a huge yeah. that's, that's um, very true. And yeah, for one of the, pro the project we're running right now, we're, we're spinning up like 11 or 12 containers just to do dev. Which the Mac people and the Windows people start complaining because like, ah, my machine's getting slow. I'm like, yeah, but mine's just blazing fast, like as if I no different. So that's why that's what I'm talking about. Maybe this will get more, better. More when... Sam, most of our task is just like five arrive, uh, file is in S3 bucket, generate event, SQS, and after this Lambda. Lambda doing a usually API call to some outside service. So is there any advantage to run it on no. Fargate? No, I don't think so. so. No, I think stay, stick with what you're doing. That, that's yeah. that's the gonna, best. You know, the other thing is, you know, there's step functions in, in Lambda. So I, I would think if you start yeah. having to think of step functions in Lambda, then maybe it makes sense to move something to Fargate just because having to deal with, with exceptions in your in your in your state machine probably a lot easier to deal with i will it's say good. it's super easy to use step functions in the cdk now like they mm -hmm. they make it pretty nice it's easy to set up parallel um get email alerts when something fails and things like yeah. that. yeah all right ken you're gonna have to do a cdk talk all right because <laughs> i know like zero about it but i keep hearing everyone talk about it and it does sound pretty awesome i i did a talk on it for CloudConf, but it's so different than what it was six oh, months yeah. ago. So, so don't you think don't go watch that talk then? <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, it's not as great. Because step functions used to suck, in my opinion, like what yeah. Greg was saying, right? Like they were such a pain. But now um, the state language is just, it's a lot easier in CDK, not so much in some of the other services, but. Yeah, I'd say keep, keep your infrastructure and your code of your project as simple as you possibly can keep it until you just have to go to that next level. So if the Lambda stuff is working for you and you're, you're developing on it happily and you're not, not banging your head against the desk because something's hard to do. I was going to ask next about uh, health checks in Fargate. Because we were, we were running into that a little bit. It's almost like we need more intelligent type health checks. Because it seems right now that basically if it just doesn't give you a good response, it, it kills it. And then it just will keep killing until you have no containers left. Mm -hmm. That's how we uh, get our CTO's attention. <laughs> yeah, you'll just start killing the service like immediately over and over get a get an email right away that that way hey i need uh, you for a meeting let me go kill some stuff yeah just push something bad to the stage <laughs> so i don't know we haven't solved that but we definitely run into it so <laughs> that's funny that you mention it so we're not the only, no one's alone here. We're, we're all we're all in good company. It almost seems like when something dies because of the health check failure, it doesn't need one replacement; it needs two replacements. Yeah, exactly. Like because you just took away a portion of your you know load and threw it on the rest of them that are all probably also struggling. It should it should almost be configurable like that. If this if you have to trash one of my containers, you better be putting back two or three. To replace it because we're, we're heading down a, a, a death spiral at this point because you could you, you literally you can watch it cascade we've been doing some locust tests against our app 
and you can be running along steady state and as soon as one falls over then like the next six just all like tumble in order and then it's just it's error city um, okay still go back to the fargate and running program in fargate how, how are you getting log file i mean with lambda i have log file in cloud watch same and it's easy same and you, you, you make sure make sure your containers are outputting to standard out and then you'll get logs in CloudWatch. So that, that is nice. If you're kind of following the, you know, the 12 factor app as practices, then things really work nicely because you get logs go to the right places and, and you basically make sure your container is fully immutable. You're not writing anything in the container. What about alerts and metrics? Actually, Caleb just set up some, the new detail, what was that detailed container stat stuff? That's pretty oh, cool. Uh, container insights. Container insights, yeah. yeah. It's kind of nice. I, I, think, I think alerts and metrics are always a work in progress. <laughs> always. <'Cause> they're, <laughs> they're either not telling you something that's important or they're telling you things that aren't important. And you just have to like, I don't know, shave some off, spackle some back on, shave some <laughs> off again. But uh, I mean, the, so like the approach, like turning on container insights has been useful for like, oh, why did this stuff fall over? But just in terms of like g generic, like health, right? The um, red, right? The, the <clears throat> shoot, I forget. I don't know, the, the, the amount of load that's on the server, right? Right, incoming requests, um, the number of errors that the service is returning and then the latency for, for that handling is like the, like, is this thing healthy or not? Is it working well enough? Um, just like those three things are all I ever try to bother looking at. Uh. And, I, and I'm coming around on that one. I used to like see all the things under the sun and I don't know. Um, so something uh, we do run into with Fargate, uh, particularly with our Go applications is we'll lose connection to another AWS server or service like internally, like RDS, for example, and get yeah, like a connection that. refused broken pipe um, in sort of like an unpredictable way. Like it might be up for three hours, it might be up for like three weeks and then suddenly just like lose connection and not get itself back. Um, and I don't know, is that something people experience we were saying name resolution errors recently when we were doing some yeah. testing like that. I'm like, I don't understand what, why that's broken. But I don't know. I, I don't know what to do about that. It's almost like you have to build your app to take that into consideration. Yeah, it's hard to know if it's just like a US East one issue sometimes or <laughs> if it's the AWS SDK or some other library that's being used. But we do see that sometimes and it will just like, I don't know, something will break and then we'll open like, try to open a thousand different file handles to like establish a new connection while something's down. But it's not obvious what it, like they're all these private IP addresses within like our VPS. So it's hard to know like what, what's going on or we don't know where to look exactly. You could just port scan all of your IP blocks in your private looking for a database and connect to it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. It's a bad it'd idea. Be to, it'd be fun to write something to do that. Yeah. That's the health check. It's like the opposite of the chaos monkey. It's like it's like chaos, like find a DB any DB server and just make your app connect to it, see what happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you guys opened any ticket with AWS for this? For any of these issues? Some, oh, sometimes yeah, we, do. <laughs> we probably don't, like, we could do a better job maybe, but it's also hard to know. And the, the, when you open a ticket, they're just pretty much phenomenal. They'll just be like, okay, look, like these are all the things we just pulled up for your account. And we can be like, well, either this makes sense or we have no idea what this means, but we have started to, and I think that's, that's helped us. Um, so yeah, yeah, it depends on what department you're in or what, what yeah. group you're getting support from. Because we've opened up AWS support tickets for stuff in like RDS or DMS. 
and it's not been great until you get like the one good person who's like actually knows what they're doing. Yeah, so I don't know. Sometimes it's hard to establish if the like if the question you gave them is right. So, so I don't know. Usually take the benefit of the doubt on our end. Be like, what the heck happened on this day? And they'll just tell us what they tell us. <laughs> and we'll decide if it's important enough to continue. But <laughs> it's nice to have that option. Um, so do people use CloudFormation at all, or is it really like uh, CDK or Terraform as the two best choices? I would probably use CDK over CloudFormation these days, yeah. In JavaScript or Python? Me? Python. I guess it depends on what your most, your most, your most experience with. I just use Terraform because I'm too dumb to program. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would I would say one of the benefits is kind of whatever the language of your applications is in, use that, right? Like all of my stuff is TypeScript, so I use TypeScript, but if you mostly use Python, that makes sense. Or if it's not your application developers doing it, whatever your you know, ops people or whoever whoever is handling it is familiar with. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter too much with JSII, um, so you can kind of do whatever. Unless you want to build those functional components, then I think, or cross components, then you have to write them in TypeScript. So for those of us who have no idea what JSII, JSII is, could you explain that? That's what AWS is, uses to cross compile and build the packages for all the different languages. So you can write, they write their components, and it's all based off of CloudFormation spec, but they build them all based off of TypeScript and then it generates it into Python, Java, C Sharp, and I think those are the only four. I don't think they support Go yet. Yeah, or, they really need to support Go. That would be awesome. They're, they're working on it right now. There's like an RFC out for it. So I've been following it quite a bit because I started using it in like 1.25 and it's on 1.63 now. So it's so much better, but they, they do have an RC for Go. Oh, that's good. I'm going to be looking forward to that. Because I, I think like the idea of um, using a programming language to specify your platform or your um, infrastructure is just so much better to me than some kind of markup language. Um, so I think it's a good, it's a good story, but I just don't know, like that's not appealing enough for me to jump into JavaScript or Python yet as it's in progress. Um, yeah. I don't is, there, know. is there an advantage to using TypeScript for that? It's, it's I, I'm still, I'm a TypeScript newbie. I've not bought in on it yet. It, yeah, I mean, it's just an application preference, right? So yeah, if I, I don't know, if AWS is like prioritizing TypeScript, then I would lean that way over what they're yeah. not. That, that's what I'm hearing, but I'd rather yeah. not. A lot but, of the examples yeah. you'll find will be in TypeScript, so there's that. But they, I mean, they have plenty of Python ones, but those are those are the two main ones. I have rarely ever seen anything Java or C sharp, as far as examples go. But I know the community is really asking for Go as well, so that's that'll that'll probably be better supported than .NET and Java. So that'd be my guess. That's cool. What other serverless topics have we not covered that are of interest to folks? This is interesting. I'm looking into the CDK stuff now. I haven't heard people speak as favorably of it before. So it's basically just built using a programming language instead of a templating language, but it's still built on top of cloud formation. Yeah. Hmm. So what's 
cool is the idea of writing unit tests for your infrastructure. Yeah. And you it's could do perfect. that. That's, that sounds awesome, but I don't, like for us, we're not using really JavaScript or Python in our company. So <laughs> there's less appeal to just jump into that than right. there is to stick to what people have been doing. Especially if you don't, like if you do want to move to it in the future, you don't want to do it twice, probably. So that makes that makes a lot of sense. Is there not like a test kitchen for Terraform? So you could write unit tests against Terraform? There is, there's uh, AWS spec at least. Yeah. So I'm not sure, I mean, so how do, how do unit tests work for infrastructure things, right? Like. How do you know that I, I need a VPC, it's got three private subnets, three public subnets, all that stuff. How do you write unit tests for that without actually spinning up the resources? Yeah, that last part is the is the kicker there, right? I mean, <laughs> everyone always <laughs> says, oh, you can easily test it by spinning it up in a brand new account. And yeah, like, I right. mean, are you just like testing the contents of your resulting cloud formation template at that point? Yeah, so I, I can post it in NDA AWS. That might be easier than in the Zoom chat. But yes, please. <laughs> just testing against the, the the CloudFormation resource that comes back, and then you can you can say name this or properties this, and just make sure that the template has those. You can't. So you don't really know if it's going to pass because you can, like right. totally throw in like uppercase characters were not allowed or things like that. Yeah, those things could still fail. Yeah. So AWS spec. I think I did like a quick talk on that at an Indie, Dev Indie DevOps a long time ago. Um, where, you know, what you spin it up and it's, it's running and then you can actually run AWS spec across it and say, okay, I expect to have these things. And if they're not there, then you throw a red flag, which is great for, you know, I think probably a combination of both of those approaches is the right way to do it. The check, the con check the contents of your cloud formation up front and then, and then check that it actually created what you expect it to after the fact. And why not to do something like Python Botos 3 and describe instance or whatever is related to VPC? Um, whatever so CDK basically is, a, you know, it's, a, it's an abstraction of Bottle 3. I mean, you can certainly create things with Bottle 3 just like you can create things with, you know, AWS CLI and Bash, but um, CDK is more for just, I'm going to be working in the cloud, I guess. No, yeah, I mean a like a unit test. I mean, oh. you create an environment, and after this, run something like Botos 3 y AWS CLI to check if it's really created. Yeah, maybe. <clears throat> I think I think that it's like if for the same reason that you don't just use Boto 3 to spin everything up. Um, if yeah. there's if you have tooling that will make running that check easier. Um, then, heck, use the tool. Oh. Well, and also if you're uh, into a programming language and you're trying to, like you might want to not spit up a thousand things if you're looping over an object, I don't know. It's, I think like the way you start building your infrastructure will change if you're suddenly able to script it uh, rather than declare it. So, I don't know, for better or worse, I, I like the idea of that being a first class citizen rather than something I just do and then, yeah, like write shell scripts to check other things that I'm throwing together. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm a Terraform fanboy, but there's also, Terra, there's also Terra test as well. Yeah. So. I think oh, it's nice I, because there's also, there's also tooling around things like Terraform to you know, check your code and syntax highlighting and linting and to make sure you're you're going to get what you know at least halfway to the right thing just by tab completing a few things. Yeah, that's, that's the only way I stumble through it. Think about it. It's like how does that interact with your favorite IDE, which is yeah, you know. Yeah, so I'm I'm on PyCharm, which has Terraform support. It has the AWS extensions built into it. It it's pretty nice. As a I database think, uh, explorer. The Python CDK, right? Like PyCharm is just gonna be like, well, this is Python, right? Yeah, go. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll get all the the crazy PyCharm stuff happening for yeah. uh, CDK in that case. 
But it sounds like even with PyCharm, I can get the crazy TypeScript stuff happening too. That's mm -hmm. all supported. I will say I used to hate TypeScript. And this year, I found that I loved it. OK, you, again, you're going to could show me what that, that magic dust was that you sprinkled well, to find that. Well, so I, I, static types. Yeah. But I, I don't do that. I'm not into that. I guess I don't know. I never wrote really any front end until this year. So I use React, and then I use AppSync. And using TypeScript really helps marry all those types between the GraphQL schema and then down into the front end. So. Mm -hmm. It all just kind of married up really well together and syncs across everything. But if you're not doing that, then yeah, it doesn't really matter. Well, we are. I mean, we've got a Re our main app's a, a React app now. And we've got, so people are like, why aren't you using TypeScript yet? I'm like, well, I don't know. It sounds like a lot of extra typing, like little, literal typing, not. It sucks at first. It, <laughs> Um, and that you can run into some weird issues and don't worry. I, I have plenty of places where I put any, um, just to kind of <laughs> on with my life, but it finds you know, tons of things that you just otherwise yeah. have to figure out on your own. So. Hmm. That's cool. Awesome. This has been a great conversation. I really, I've enjoyed this. I don't know what everyone else thinks about this format. I think folks are getting tired of Zoom meetings where it's just you're just being talked at the whole time. I'm curious if this format would work as well in person. Yeah, I don't know. Well, so periodically we would do IndiePie, and we have not. I don't think we've ever done an Indie AWS where we called fishbowl sessions, where we put like five chairs up front, okay. and then to to we go around the room and everyone introduces themselves and says the topic they'd like to hear about. And we put them on a list and then we, then we go around the room again and everyone votes for like the things they actually want to hear about. And so we take the top three or four and time box them. We're going to say, we're going to talk about this one for 10 minutes. And to be speaking, you need to be in a chair. So whether you want to like ask a question or talk about a thing, you just can't blurt out a thing from the audience. You have to like let it go tap somebody out. So it kind of makes a social dynamic that's more interesting for this kind of a discussion. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. And it gets folks up in the chair in front of the crowd who wouldn't normally get up in front of the crowd. I think, yeah. yeah, just kind of sitting in a big circle would be difficult to manage this. Right. I think just uh, with the fishbowl, when you have the rule of you can't ask a question without, or yeah. you can't answer a question without asking a question, that just helps regulate who's talking just by having that, <laughs> like, restriction. So I am a fan of that. I also like the fact that if you think someone's just commandeering too much of the conversation, you can just literally go tap them out and not even say anything. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Well, excellent. Speaking of Zoom fatigue, I'm about done for the day. But I want to thank you all for joining us for uh, Indie AWS. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And if you have any questions, there is the Slack channel. Uh, join us there. There's lots of nice folks. We're happy to answer all kinds of questions and uh, talk to you all. So we'll see you all next month. Uh, oh, thanks, and if you, guys got, if you guys got ideas, or anyone has ideas for uh, topics, throw them in that uh, Slack channel, and I'll, I'll find somebody or some, a group of people who can kind of be a subject matter expert to come in and talk to us. Is it next month, or is it in two months? Is it the every oh, other? That's a good question. Josh left. I, I'm without my keepers. That, that, that could be bad, as Caleb knows. When, I, when I'm not super, when I'm not supervised, you know, I could say all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, but Josh will send out a, a note to the group probably this week, you know, wrapping up this one and talking about what's happening next. But you might be right. I think it might be in two months. Yeah, I shameless to self promote something. Please do. Yeah. So the twenty second, Indie DevOps has uh, Code Fresh coming in. Um, Dan Garfield, who is the uh, chief techno technological evangelist or something. Um, I was right, Chief Technology Evangelist at CodeFresh. So they are coming to talk about uh, 13 features every modern CI CD tool should have. But, Ooh, yeah. That's awesome. You said so, what yeah, day is that? Right. Hmm? What day is that? That's the 22nd. So we always have, uh, Indie, Indie DevOps always meets on the last Tuesday of the month um, or thereabouts. Looks like this may not be the last Tuesday of the month. <laughs> 
but we're also doing it online and we're on Meetup. So just do just just search on Meetup for Indie DevOps. Awesome. Maybe. Sounds fun. It does sound fun. Excellent. Well, we'll see you all online or in the next next Indie DBS. All right. Cool. Thanks for having us. Have a good night, guys. Yeah. Talk see to you later. Thanks, guys. All right. Bye. Yeah.